coming up, I check out the ZX AY. I play some games. I look at a new piece of recreated hardware. And end with a type in. Let's get on then. We all know and love the original 16 and 48k sounds on the spectrum. They ranged from simple beeper effects. Beeper music and with special sound engines some pretty good multi-channel music. When the Spectrum 128 arrived, followed by the Plus 2 and Plus 3, a new era of Spectrum sound was released to the world, the AY chip. It was not a new chip, and had been used in countless other computers and consoles. Slowly games and demos took advantage, and some impressive sounds could be experienced. As time went on, several questions needed answering. Mainly, how could 48k users get the wonderful AY sound? Secondly, because other countries used a different channel layout, how could this be fixed? The AY chip has three channels, usually designated as ABC, and this gives channel A and B on the left, and C and B on the right. However, some Eastern European countries produce games and demos with channels set to ACB, with A and C on the left, and B and C on the right. And lastly, some models of the spectrum, infamously some plus threes, had a bodged sound circuit, making the AY output distorted. One answer to most of these questions is the ZX AY. A small interface that can be connected to any model of spectrum. It outputs stereo and has a clean signal, and can be switched between ABC and ACB. This is done via jumpers on the board itself. You can get it in a nice case or as an open circuit board. I got the open one. It's a small neat board that you simply plug into the back of your spectrum, connect a standard stereo jack to a decent pair of speakers, and you're ready to go. The interface also works with things like DivMMC and ZXHD, and in this instance I'm having all three connected at once. Some titles, back in the 80s, for 48k machines, are listed as having AY sound, so I thought there'd be a lot of games to explore, but there aren't. Let's have a look at a few that say they do have AY sound. First, Kronos. Nope, doesn't sound like AY to me. And then Commando from Elite which also doesn't seem to have it. At Moonstrike, this had 128k music and effects, but only on the 128k machine. Mr. Heli, also noted as having AY, and it didn't have in either version. Energy Warrior had some nice music, but I don't think it's AY. And Rex, did have AY sound, but only on the 1 to 8 machines. So let's quickly skip on to more modern titles then. Roust, a great version of the arcade classic, with AY sound and effects. Bobby Carrot, a great game with AY sounds and music. Baldi ZX, although it didn't have any music, it did have AY sound. And Lunar Lander RX. game that does have AY sound, and a great game it is too. Skipping on to 1 to 8k titles then, and as you can expect, there's a lot of these. But using the ZX AY you get a really clean signal, and it sounds fantastic. Let's start with the Adams Family. And how about Batman? And a bit of Castlevania. There's also been a recent release of retro-hacked 48k games that add AY music. Tapper, for instance, sounds okay. Come 
Orlando from Elite now has some decent music. Night Law? Although the music is okay, if you go into a room with lots of bouncing things it does get into a bit of an audio mess. And you're not going to believe this, Hungry Horace has been hacked with AY music, oh dear. And even Jetpack, and I'm not really sure about that one, but it's there if you want it. As you can imagine, demos have always proved a good place for things like this. There are demos for 48k machines that use the AY chip. The ZX AY is a great interface if you want good quality stereo sound from your spectrum without internally modding or poking around with a soldering iron. It can be tricky trying to get across the quality of the sound when it's been recorded in various ways, compressed, uploaded, decompressed, etc. But here's a direct recording from the ZX AY card straight into my PC. It's easy to use and produces crisp sound. And as a bonus, it even outputs the beeper correctly mixed in with AY, which is great. A recommended interface then, if you're a discerning audiophile. This is Fiendish Freddy's Big Topo Fun, released by Mindscape in 1990. The box includes screenshots, but not from the Spectrum version. You run a small circus, but have come across hard times, and now the bank wants you to pay back $10,000. To be able to do this, you have to get your performers to do their best work, but the bank has sent Fiendish Freddy to interrupt things and cause havoc. The better your performers perform, the better chance you'll have of paying back the money. Luckily you can practice all of the events before you start the game for real. There are six events with multiple levels that you move up through if you complete the previous one. At the start you can choose to be any of five animal characters to represent yourself, but there's no real reason for this, at least that I can see. On to the first event then, and the high dive. Here you play Horace the high diver, and you start by climbing the ladder to the lowest stage. Once you press fire, the dive begins, and here you have to waggle the joystick left and right to make him spin. You have to perform an action on the way down, which is highlighted, and when it flashes, you move the joystick in one of eight directions to perform it. There are things like the swan, the pike, and yoga. Completing these will earn extra cash. Once the first level is complete, if you don't miss the pool that is, and to hit that you have to keep an eye on the target on screen, and make sure you don't drift off you move to the next and harder stage of the same level. On to the higher levels then and more waggling of the joystick and more posing. During all of this, Fiendish Freddy can appear with a huge fan to blow Horace off course. After you complete this, or miss the pool, the judges appear, after a short load that is, and give you their scores. The next event is juggling with Jeffy Joe the Juggler. Your assistant, a seal, throws objects into the air and the juggler has to catch them and juggle them. This is done via 
by releasing an item you are holding in either your left or right hand and catching the one that's coming down. You also have to move the juggler left or right to catch the objects. Randomly, Fiendish Freddy will appear and throw a bomb into the mix. If you drop it, it will explode. If you catch it, you've got a chance of throwing it back and carrying on with the game. after another load. Next is Fiona on the trapeze. Once you get onto the trapeze, you waggle to swing left and right, and then you press fire to jump onto the next trapeze, trying to time your jump so you actually catch the trapeze rather than plummeting to your death. randomly again to cut the rope if you stay on the trapeze too long. This level also has hoops and fire to jump through. Once complete, it's back to the judges. Next we have knife throwing with Nancy Knife tied to a rotating wheel. Daggers at the balloons and hopefully hit them and not Nancy. Weirdly, I found this the most trickiest level. Randomly, Freddy will drop a smoke bomb, making it impossible to see Nancy. After the judges, we get the next event, which is the tightrope, performed by Tony Tiptoe. You walk along the rope by pressing forward, and you have to maintain your balance by pressing left or right. After the judges, we get onto the final event, the Human Cannonball. Here you check the amount of gunpowder, represented by the cannon at the bottom left of the screen, and then you move the target closer or further away from the main cannon. You then press fire and the cannon will swivel around to the correct angle. You press fire again when you think it's right and Fernando will fly through the air and hopefully hit the target. I tried so many times to hit that target, and it was almost as annoying as the rope swinging hunchback. I did manage to hit it twice though, after about 50 attempts. The graphics in the game are large, well drawn and comical. The animation is good and there's plenty of it, but then again you do have to load each section. The control is simple, but with so many variations in so many levels, it can mean having to grab for the manual between each event. The game is multi-load, even on 1 to 8k machines, so there's a fair amount of waiting between levels, especially when the judges appear in between each one. Sound is good too, with a nice tune playing throughout and some nice spot effects. Let's see what the judges thought about it all then. The game ends when all the events have been completed. If you manage to get over $10,000, you save the circus. I never did. It's got a lot of playability, until you manage to complete everything that is but that could take a long time. 
due to the various levels, and of course the loading time. When I first played this game I hated it, but eventually it grew on me, but I won't be playing it again though. This is Mighty Magus, released by Quicksilver in 1985. I always wanted to play this game when it first came out. It looked so cool, and the cover was fantastic. Let's see if the actual game lives up to it then. You control a wizard who has to descend to the deepest dungeons to kill a dragon. There are 30 dungeons to get through, and you obviously start at the very top. You can move left or right and automatically move upstairs, which can be a bit annoying. You can jump into the stairs though to get through them, but this can often be tricky. There are doors which don't really do anything at all, they're just scenery. And there are piles of rubbish around that you can search, and these may yield important items like weapons, shields or magic. There are also chests and other things you can search. To search an item, you press the search key, and the other two important keys are the fight key and the jump key. All good so far then, but then there are the traps. These are the things that are hidden in the floor, and that trigger something when you walk over them. Some transport you back to the start, some kill you instantly, some bounce you around the screen, some cause you to fall through the floor, and they're sometimes hard to see, and there's a lot of frustration in this game. Even after 10 plays, I still got caught out and never got past the first dungeon, until I realised that there aren't actually separate dungeons, just levels. As you move further down, the levels count down with you. When you drop from a certain height, you slump in a pile on the floor and lose health, so you have to be careful of the distance you're going to drop. You have magic to help you, and this has a power range of 1 to 9, accessed by the number keys. This can help fight monsters, but is very useful for making walls passable as well. There are monsters roaming about, and you have an option to fight them, with or without magic but your success will be calculated on your current statistics and a random number. The screen scrolls as you move, but it's in character squares, and it reminds me a little bit of Alchemist by Imagine. Sound is limited to a few spot effects, which is a bit of a shame really. This game could have done with a nice AY soundtrack. A bit of spooky music would have worked really well. I'll be honest, I was disappointed when I played this game, so many traps in the floor, and it made the first five or six plays very frustrating. Once I got the hang of it and I learned what each trap did and how to locate it, the game did improve for me. It's a slow moving pathfinding game. You have to take your time and find the best route down. This type of game may not suit everyone, and I think for 1985 it could have been a lot better. Recently there have been some nice recreations of old hardware, for those that don't want to buy old kit that might fail, or simply because the hardware is not available. In episode 120 I tested the recreated Specmate, which worked exactly like the original. A more simpler piece of hardware is also now available, this, the recreated Interface 2. Yes you can buy Sinclair's Interface 2 on eBay for about 50 to 80 pounds, or even the Ram Turbo or Kempston variants, again though these will cost you up to £30 or more, depending on condition. These though are old, and this is brand new. It's a neat and small interface, much smaller than the original Sinclair one. It has a ROM slot on top, and a reset switch. It doesn't have a pass-through port, or even joystick ports, but then again it only costs £13. I got it from eBay, but you can see the URL on the board if you don't want to use that particular site. It works just as you would expect. You plug it in, obviously turning the power off to the spectrum first, plug a cart in. Now which one shall I choose? Let me see. 
Once selected, you turn the spectrum on and you can play the game. The interface also works on plus two and plus three machines, selectable via a small jumper. Now the thing is, why would you want a reset switch if you have to turn the power off to swap the cartridges? Well, you can now get cartridges that hold multiple games, like the ZXC4, reviewed in episode 109. But even though the ZXC4 works on a real interface too, it would not work on this one. I tested it with several other multi-game cartridges and it worked just fine. So it seems whatever is happening here is probably caused by the ZXC4. One problem is the reset switch. It just didn't work on multi-game cartridges. Just like the Ram Turbo and other clones, resetting it will either crash the game, as in the DKtronics cartridge, or just reset the game back to the start, like it did on the Sinclair Collection cartridge. As with other clones, one of which will be reviewed in a later show, the cartridge connector is a standard component, and some modern cartridges may need filing slightly to fit in. That's not a problem at all though, and it took me only a few minutes to get this sorted out with one of my cartridges. It's a small, well-made, modern clone of Interface 2. If you're in the market for something cheap to play ROM games on, then this is the answer. This is Magic Minis, released by CDS Software, in 1983. You play a wizard who has the power to turn lead into gold, and armed with only crystal balls and four magic apples, you head into the lead mines. You have to collect all of the lead from each of the levels, plus, for some reason, a cherry. Yes, this is a basic Dig Dug clone. You can dig under the apples to make them drop down, blocking or killing the meanies. Oh yes, I forgot, the mines are guarded by magic meanies. The graphics are 8 pixel user definable graphics and move in character jumps. Control is a bit sticky, especially the fire key. Often there's a pause before you actually fire anything, meaning that if you're being chased by a line of meanies and turn to fire, they usually get you first. If you get killed, the screen redraws, meaning all the lead you have collected is back, which is a bit annoying. The monsters usually just head for you, especially if there's a clear route, and then just follow you around. You can sometimes use this to your advantage, but most times it means you're going to die. The apples can be dropped or pushed into the minis, but it's tricky to line things up. There is music playing, but this can be turned off if you don't like it. It's a simple version of a popular game, and it's better than many other 16k titles trying to do the same thing. This is Quack Attack, published in Popular Computing Weekly in June 1984, and it was written by Gordon Smith. This was a full page listing that looked fairly simple, with no complex basic or machine code. Once it was typed in, there were a few problems though. The bird was cut in half when you pressed the fire button, and the gun turned into a bullet for some reason. Anyway, a few minutes later, and we can see the game. OK, it's a very simple game, and one we've seen many times before. You can't move left or right, just fire. And once you press the fire, you have to wait until the bullet, which will inevitably be missed, reach the top of the screen before you can fire again. You also have to hit the bird in the body, as sometimes hitting it in the head has no effect. A short, simple game then.
This is probably the first time it's been seen since it was published, and it will be available to download from my website shortly. This is Bomberbot, released by Gabriel Amour in 2023. Here we have a simple idea based on the classic Bomberman games, with a little twist added. You have to clear the nuclear plant of aliens, and to do this you use your bombs. Each bomb, however, will cost you energy points, but energy points can be replenished by killing aliens or collecting energy pills. Walls have to be destroyed to allow you to move around, and this means you need to plan your moves. The aliens do not follow set patterns, and you have limited bombs, so it's important that you trap them where possible and kill them at the first attempt. Other elements in later levels include laser beams and exploding energy pills. The game has been written using AGDX and looks really nice. There's a great tune playing along and the action is just the right pace. This is a really great game. Go and grab it now. <laughs> 